good. And I want to uh, uh, thank Pastor Jeff. He comes in and we use him as much as we can. I appreciate him so much. He always brings a good word for us. And uh, it gives Pastor a little break. <laughs> I get a chance to catch up on some reading. I've been reading uh, Harbinger too. And uh, it's really blessing me. And so I get a chance to catch up with that. But I really appreciate Jeff and Sandy. Appreciate their ministry. And uh, Pastor Jeff, come and bless us. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. appreciate uh, Bob and Delphi as well. You know, they they have a shepherd's heart, don't they? Yes. And we appreciate them setting up this building so that we can come together and to worship, you know. And uh, it's been wonderful to, uh, you know, a lot of other churches are struggling. Um, but uh, God's, you know, blessed us so far. Amen. We're, we're thankful for that. Amen. We lift him up and we, we thank him for, for that. Well, are you ready for some meat today? Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to talk to you about a subject that's, um, it may be, you know, considered a little off topic. It's, it's about the end time. Uh, it's about the return of Jesus. It's about the return of our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. But what a better time to talk about that than Christmas. Amen? First time Jesus came, he came very humbly, right? In a manger. Uh, there wasn't a lot of fanfare. He wasn't born in the, build, in the middle of a Jerusalem, in the middle of a big city. He was born in a very humble place. But the second time he comes, it's going to be a little different, isn't it? Um, and he's actually coming, I believe, for his bride first, right? The Bible tells us that he's going to meet us in here. And uh, what a wonderful thing uh, to think about during this time, you know. He came once, he provided a way for us. We now can have a relationship with God. We can have a close personal relationship with him. And uh, he's preparing a place for us as we speak. And he's gonna be coming back again. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, this message really, uh, God gave me a while back uh, it just took me a while to kind of formulate it and put it into place. It's entitled Peace and Safety. Um, and our key verse is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. And uh, that, that verse says this. It says, For when they say, Peace and Safety. In my Bible, there's an exclamation point right there. Peace and Safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Let's pray. Lord, we, we want to rightly divide your word today, Lord. We want, we want to hear from your Holy Spirit, Lord God, not from man. So we just ask, Lord God, that you would just let your word, Lord, teach us today. Let your Holy Spirit Teach us today, Lord, the things that are to come, Lord, and we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I would like to kind of go through this entire passage with you today. It's 11 short verses, not very long, and it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Uh, Norma should have uh, all of the scriptures kind of queued up here, so... Um, They'll display them for you on the screen, but it's always a good idea to have a backup in it. Amen. Have that Bible backup, whether it's on your phone or whether it's just a good old-fashioned paper version of the Bible. Um, in my Bible, this passage is entitled "The Day of the Lord," and that's a much broader subject. I'm not going to cover that today. I want to focus in on that peace and safety phrase. But the Apostle Paul is writing to the Thessalonians about the second coming of our Lord here, isn't he? And in doing so, he kind of focuses in on these events that will occur 
He doesn't give us the day or the hour. Uh, the Bible tells us that no one except the Father knows that. And so if anybody tells you they know the day and the hour, uh, that's not scriptural. But this past passage tells us very clearly that the church will have foreknowledge of these events. Uh, let's turn and go back to verse 1 and begin there. It says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Well, what times and seasons is Paul talking about? Well, if you go to the previous chapter, Paul describes an event that will occur in the future, and I think many of you are well aware of that event. It's the rapture. Yes. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 basically says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet Alleluia. of God. Alleluia. And the dead in Christ shall rise. Yes. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together Alleluia. with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. <clears throat> and thus... Shall we always be with the Lord? How many are thankful for that verse right there? <laughs> that, that, that pair of verses right there is, is our hope. That's, our, that's in our future. Amen? The Thessalonians were concerned about when this was going to happen. And I would imagine that many of you are concerned out there today. But like Paul, I'm going to tell you very simply, you don't need to worry. Amen. Even he tells them in the first verse, brothers and sisters, I don't really need to write to you about this. Why? Well, the next ten verses are going to explain. Let's look at verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Don't you love the language that Paul uses here? <laughs> For you yourselves know perfectly. Everybody say perfectly. Perfectly. Amen. We know perfectly what the scripture says, that Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. If you didn't know that when you came in the door today, then you'll know it when you leave. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. It's, in other words, the Lord's return is going to come unexpectedly. But unexpectedly for who? <clears throat> I hope that none of you ever have this misfortune, but uh, Sandy and I had our house burglarized once. We were building this house up on top of, not on top of, on the site of North Table Mountain. And um, it was very remote up there. It was all dried in, you know, we had our windows and everything, doors. Actually, I think they were kind of nailed shut at that point in the construction project. But we felt like we had nothing to worry about, you know. It was, we really didn't have concern about it. And a thief broke in one night unexpectedly. And he proceeded to steal all of our contractor's tools. Mm. And that was a heavy price to pay. If we had only known that he was coming that night, we would have been there to protect the place. We would have, you know, set up some sort of security. For many people, that's how it's going to be when Jesus returns. Yes. It's going to be unexpected. It's, it's going to happen when you least think it. They won't be ready. They're going to say, if we had only known that he was coming, we would have prepared. We would have been ready. But there's only one way to be ready, I'm telling you today. And that is to have a personal relationship Amen. with Jesus. Amen. When we have a personal relationship with the Lord, we walk with Him and we talk with Him daily. And as we'll see in this passage, we won't be surprised when He returns. Let's continue. Verse 3, our key scripture here says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
this third verse has a lot to say about the state of matters here on earth when the rapture occurs. For when they shall say peace and safety, those two words when used together are very significant. Peace means one. It means rest. And it means quietness. Safety means firmness and stability. Certainty. Security from enemies and dangers. People will be saying everything is peaceful and secure. And these kinds of words, if you think about it today, can only be used when there's a superpower nation that's keeping the peace. When Paul wrote these words, there was a different kingdom in place. It was the Roman Empire. It was the superpower of that time. And if you were a Roman, you were probably saying, everything's peaceful and secure. Why? Because we have this massive <coughs> military complex, and we're in control of all these regions around us. And we can, what the Bible says, subdue our enemies, right? We can control those people that are you know, wanting to overthrow us. So during Paul's time, that superpower was the Roman Empire. It seemed like nothing could defeat something as powerful as this Roman Empire. It went in, on in various forms for 1,500 years. But we know that the rapture didn't happen back then, did it? It, uh, it hasn't happened yet, in fact. So the Roman Empire of Paul's time wasn't the superpower that Paul was talking about here when he said peace and safety. Maybe he was talking about another empire. Who's the Roman Empire of today? The United States. Now, we won't go into it today, but there's a vision in Daniel. Daniel has this vision of four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and the fourth beast he describes as having these iron teeth. Um, and then in, later on in chapter 7, chapter 8, he actually gets an interpretation of those scriptures in the the one telling him tells him that these are kingdoms that are to come during your time or right after your time and those kingdoms that came of course were various kingdoms one that he was a part of and two more that were to follow that and then a fourth then the antichrist was to come this fourth one was the one with the iron teeth um, a lot of scholars believe that that was the Roman Empire. They had perfected warfare. They had perfected instruments of war with iron. And they had subdued their enemies. They trampled all over their enemies. They, were, they had a vast empire that surrounded the Mediterranean Sea at one point in time. Now, if translate that into today, I believe those four beasts, they also talk about entities that exist today. You know, there's, there's a description of a lion, there's a description of a bear, there's a description of a leopard. We know who those entities are today. You know, certainly uh, the bear is, is Russia. We know that the, the leopard is uh, the Arab presence. We know that the lion is, was probably the UK, uh, Europe. So a lot of these things have both a meaning, you know, back during Daniel's time and they have a meaning today. But the interesting thing is that the Bible jumps from that fourth beast into the Antichrist. So there's like a gap in there somewhere, right? 
if you if you take the translation to mean the iron teeth being the Roman Empire, well, a lot of people say, a lot of scholars say that the Roman Empire has really kind of been adopted by a number of other countries, like us, like Europe. You know, there are many things that systems of government and certainly the military industrial complex that we have, have been taken from both the Greeks and the Romans and perfected further. The United States today is keeping the peace of the world, isn't it? It is the nation that probably has the strongest military of any nation at this point in time. And you've heard that coming from the highest levels in this country. You know, we have the strongest military we've ever had. We have peace and we have safety. We have peace and we have security. In addition to this, we've been seeing these historical peace deals being made in the Middle East. Uh, some that people at the highest level said, this will never happen. And there are more to come. The big one, I believe, is you know, between Saudi Arabia and Israel. You know, one of, some of these uh, peace deals, there were previous secretaries of state in this country that said, this will never happen. And they are happening. So, if you take these things together, you take this peace element, and you take this security element, and you, and you look at what Paul is writing here in Thessalonians, people are saying this right now. People are saying peace and safety. Both the U.S. and Israel have peace and security like we've never seen. I'm talking from, you know, a military industrial complex standpoint. Obviously, there are, you know, internal problems in both countries, but the enemies looking inward toward us are saying, well, I don't think I'm going to attack them right now because their military is so strong. They'll annihilate us. But militaries like ours, like China's, like, you know, others, Russia's, in put in the wrong hands, can suddenly change things. They can change the, the landscape of the entire globe in, an, in a moment, <laughs> as Pastor was telling us about. Um, but yet, verse 3 indicates, obviously, this change could happen very quickly. Let's look closely at this key verse. Um, it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Who is them in this verse? Well, I can tell you who them isn't. It's not us. That's <laughs> right. It's not the Thessalonians that he was talking to. It's the church, in our case. Or at least the portion of the church that's walking with Christ, that's in the light, as we'll see. This is an indication that the church is going to be raptured sometime before this sudden destruction comes. Um, and here's the key. When they say peace and safety, we the church should take note. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tonight. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody knows the day or the hour. But we should take note when people are starting to say peace and safety. Spiritually speaking, it's not a time to kick back and relax. It's a time to be vigilant. It's a time to watch. It's the time to draw closer to the Lord. Let's continue reading in verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Aren't you thankful for that verse right there? Praise the Lord. 
Look at the first part of that verse. But you, brethren, who is he referring to here? Now he's referring to us. He's not referring to they and them anymore. He's talking to the Thessalonians and by extension to the church. At least the part of the church that's walking in the light. He says, But you, brethren, are not in darkness. And by saying this, he explicitly refers to those who are in the light, as we'll see. Those who are not in darkness, well, they must be in the light. They're not going to be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. And those who are in the light are going to have foreknowledge of these events. Um, whether it be through prophets in the church, whether it be through the Holy Spirit himself speaking into people's hearts, you know, I can't say exactly how. It's going to be supernatural. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be by man, that's for sure. Let's continue in verse 5. Paul says, You are the sons of light and the sons of the day. You're not of the night, nor of darkness. Here he says something very interesting. First, he, he distinguishes those who are in the light and not in the darkness, and those in the darkness not being in the light. So you can really only be in one place or the other. You kind of can't have to be halfway in the light and halfway in the dark. We're either children of the light or we're, and children of the day, or we're children of the night and the, of the darkness. Now, which one sounds more appealing to you? <laughs> That's not a trick question. <laughs> Obviously, we want to be the, you know, that in that camp that's in the light. We want to be, you know, seeking the Lord, and and uh, we want to have His Holy Spirit dwelling in us in that time. We don't want to be numb to it. We don't want to be oblivious to it. The interesting thing that Paul uses here, the interesting word that he uses is son. Um, in the King James, it actually says the uh, children of the light and the uh, children of the day. Uh, other translations say son or sons and daughters too. <laughs> but uh, what that means is it, it's kind of a, a, a possessive, right? It means that we belong to something. We belong to the light. We belong to the day. We don't belong to the darkness. Who's the light? Jesus. Amen. Who's the day spring? Amen. Jesus. Amen. Can you say that name? Amen. Jesus. Jesus. There's just something about that name. Hallelujah. I love that song when we sing it. Hallelujah. It's like the fragrance after the rain. Hallelujah. Master. Savior, Jesus, hallelujah, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. There's another song that we sing that's awesome, too. You are my God, and I belong to you, Lord. You are my God, and I will always follow you. Your ways will be my ways, and your people my people, and your truth shall be my truth. You are my God, and I have no other God but you. We belong to the church. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah. His truth is our truth. His light is our light. He gives us this indication of belonging. We belong to the light. We belong to the day. And because we belong to Jesus, we're going to have these foreknowledge, this foreknowledge of these events. Uh, think about it. He's the vine, we're the branches, right? How could the branches be connected to a vine and not know that the vine is moving? Right? We're going to be 
kind of vibrating and shaking. Yeah. When Jesus starts to move, we're going to know it. Amen? So let's continue in verse 6. This is a warning to us. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Hallelujah. Here again, we see the writer refer to another group of people. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Who is those others? Well, I believe that's part of the church that's sleeping. It's a tough message to hear, but, you know, Matthew 25 talks about the parable of the bridesmaids, whom all fell asleep, all ten of them did. But only five were foolish, and they missed the bridegroom because they didn't have enough oil for their lamps. Remember that parable? Yeah. Well, what does a lamp provide? Light. They had no light. They weren't in the light. They were in the darkness. People, I'm telling you, we need to be a church that's in the light. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be a church that's in love with the Lord. We need to be a church that's not compromising and and, and yeah. doing all the things that the Lord wants us to be doing in these days and hours Amen. that are so close to the end. We need to walk with Him and we need to talk with Him. This is not a judgment thing. This is a relationship thing. If we get that greatest commandment and we put it in the right perspective, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, yes. all thy soul, with all thy mind, if we get that in perspective, then the other laws are going to fall into place. Right? Hallelujah. Amen. Verse, it, verse 7 says, For those who sleep at night, those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. The scripture here has so much revelation. It's Let's look at the first phrase here. It says, they that sleep, sleep at night. And here's that word they again, right? He's talking about they. These are people that are not in the light. They're, they're sleeping at night. And the kind of sleep that Paul is talking about here is not physical sleep, is it? Uh, what he's talking about is spiritual sleep. <clears throat> And those that get drunk are drunk at night. Again, he's not talking about a physical drunkenness here. He's talking about a spiritual drunkenness. What would spiritual sleep be? Well, it's pretty clear. We close our spiritual eyes and we become oblivious to the Spirit. Amen. We forget about the Holy Spirit. We forget about the gifts that... The Spirit has given us. We forget about the promises that God, Jesus himself, made to us when he left and said, I'm going to leave you with a comforter, a counselor. I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you until I come back. Don't ignore the Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> pretty clear that drunkenness is becoming inebriated in the spirit, becoming numb to the spirit. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about you know, having a healthy spirit and having an excellent spirit. These are to keep you as a church healthy in your spirits, yeah. right? We go to the gym all the time to keep our bodies healthy. Why don't we do that with our spirits? Well, Amen. we are today. That's why we're here. Hallelujah. Amen. But we gotta we gotta get into the word ourselves. Amen. We gotta get on our knees ourselves. Yes, we can't just do it corporately. We gotta do it. We have to have that relationship as well. So don't become numb to the spirit. Instead, become more in tune with the spirit. Amen. Walk and talk with Jesus all day long. Have conversations with him. He's he's with us. He's dwelling in our hearts. Amen? Amen. Amen. So both of these conditions can cause us to kind of fall into this darkness. Um, 
they can cause us to forget about our, our relationship with Jesus. I've seen it happen to people. I've seen people yes. who were once on fire for Jesus, and now they're not. That's right. Now they're so far away from Jesus, I kind of wondered, were you ever? <laughs> did you ever have a relationship with him? But yes, this is this passage is describing the cycle of what can happen if we if we, if we run away from God. <clears throat> Thankfully, God's grace you know, can draw us back in, in many of those cases. And I don't pretend to know the depth of the grace of God. Because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the grace of God. Amen. But it can cause us to stop listening to the guidance from the Holy Spirit. I, I like to think of the Holy Spirit as a, of that GPS. When I'm in a car and I'm in a, in a town that I don't know anything about, you know, how many, how many of you really know the spiritual world, the spiritual realm? Um, I, I can't say I do, you know, I, I pray, I have a relationship with the Lord, um, I, I, you know, I fellowship with the saints, but I get kind of lost sometimes in the spiritual world. I need a guide. I need a GPS for the spiritual world. When I'm in a physical town that I don't know, a GPS is essential. I'll get lost, but we don't want to let, don't want to get lost. We don't want to let that happen. We don't want to become numb. We don't want to fall asleep. Wake up, church. Let's stop compromising. I'm not speaking to anyone specifically in here. I'm speaking to the church in general. Amen. Let's get back to the root of what the church really is. Amen. Yeah. A relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A passion and a hunger for living a spirit-filled life. Hallelujah, Lord. And love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Wow, these are great analogies. You know, I kind of when I look when I think of a breastplate, I think of a bulletproof vest today, right? One of those Kevlar vests. <laughs> Um, if you're in a battle, if you're, you know, if you're having bullets, arrows, whatever coming at you, uh, like we do in the spirit yeah. daily, right? The devil has a strategy. He has a plan. He is out to take you down. Amen. Yes. If you don't have your bulletproof vest on, I'm telling you, you're going to get hurt. Amen. Okay. We need to have that bulletproof vest on. We need to have faith and love. Those are the keys. And then the second analogy is like a helmet, right? Yeah. Well, of course, being a guy, I think of football, right? <laughs> helmet technology is a big deal. I was uh, reading, uh, actually, I think it was a documentary I think I was watching that uh, talked about how in the beginning of football, they didn't have helmets. No helmets in football. <laughs> that, that should shock you. It shocked me. But there are actually people dying on the field because of the collisions. Uh, and I believe um, it was one of our presidents. Chuck would probably know. Or one of our presidents basically said, this has to stop. You guys have to, either we're going to get rid of football or you guys are going to have to change because <laughs> there are too many people dying on the football field. So they started wearing these helmets. At first, they were kind of weak, right? They were these leather helmets. They called them leather heads. And uh, they still, when you collide, still some damage could be done, right? Now the helmet technology is phenomenal, right? It, it's a big deal. Players have, have you know, been hurt very badly by, by collisions. We have to have that same mentality. We have to have the technology, right, in the spirit to have this helmet. What is that technology? It's the hope of our salvation. It's not a technology at all. It's, it's Jesus. It, he's the hope of our salvation, and we need to keep him in focus at all times. If we have him in focus, we have the most perfect helmet we could ever have. We're not going to get hurt. Hallelujah, Lord. Such powerful analogies. Verse 9 and 10, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, 
but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. who what? Died for us. Amen. That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, of course, wake or sleep, the wake or sleep he's talking about there is he's talking about whether you're dead or alive. You know, whether there are people who are, are dead who are going to rise, mm -hmm. and there are people who are going to be alive who will also at the same time yes. meet the Lord in the air. Mm -hmm. You know, that verse talks about him meeting us in the air. He's actually not coming back to the earth physically at that point, right? He's going to meet us in the air. There'll be a time when he comes back to the earth, <coughs> and he'll set foot on the Mount of Olives again. But this is a different time this is a slightly different time right it's the rapture it's just when we meet him in the air and we do not do not want to miss that I'm telling you. <laughs> so hence these scriptures that I'm sharing with you today and Paul obviously shared them with the Thessalonians to encourage them to try and tell them hey you know be vigilant be in the light <clears throat> There's going to be a point when God says enough is enough. Yes, right. This is the day of the Lord. It starts right here. And it starts with the rapture, I believe. I've studied on some of the judgments in the Bible. And you do not want to be a part of one of these judgments. I'm speaking to all those people out on the internet as well. You do not want to be in judgment. You want a personal relationship with Jesus. And if you don't have a personal relationship with him, it's very simple. All you have to do is repent of your sins. You have to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. And he'll come in. And he'll dwell in your heart. It's a very simple prayer to say, I repent of my sins, Lord. I ask forgiveness for all those things that I've done against you, Lord. For all those things that I've done against other people, Lord God, I'm sorry for those things. Lord Jesus, come into my heart tonight. Come into my heart today. I make you my Lord and Savior, Lord, and I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want a personal relationship with you, Lord. Hallelujah. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for, yes. for being my Savior, Amen. for being my Lord. If you said that prayer, I believe, I believe that you're saved. Hallelujah. And God will begin to change your life. He'll begin to refine you and change you may not happen all at once. I remember when I was saved, I, I said those prayers, and over the course of the next several days, my life was transformed. God works some miracles in my life that you can't describe with human knowledge. And then I've walked with Him ever since. It hasn't always been easy. It hasn't always been perfect. But I'll tell you one thing, the work that he starts in you, he's going to complete. Yes. He's not going to give up on you. Don't give up on him. Hallelujah, Lord. One last verse, amen? amen. And it's the, it's the comfort verse. Verse 11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another. That's what we're doing today. I'm comforting you. I'm edifying you. Now go out and do with others. Uh, edify one another just as you also are doing. <clears throat> and you are also doing that too. Amen? Amen. I want to comfort you today with this passage of Scripture. Let's pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you provide the word for us, Lord God. We thank you that you use the Holy Spirit to speak into men like Paul and to, to give us wisdom and knowledge through your Holy Spirit, Lord. Amen. Lord, we we want to get in line with your word. We want, to, we want a closer relationship with you today, Lord. Yes. We want to know when you move, Lord God. Hallelujah. We thank you for giving us 
these signs and these seasons, Lord God, that we can use to to heighten our spiritual attention, Lord God, to draw closer to you. I pray that each and every person in this place, Lord God, would draw closer to you today, Lord. Each person listening on the internet to this service, Lord God, would draw closer to you, Lord. I pray that your church would be strengthened, Lord. I pray that your church would be in the light, Lord God, that you return when you return, Lord God. I pray that you will find faith on this earth when you return, Lord Jesus. And I know, Lord God, that you are faithful and true. So I know that you will, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you today. Hallelujah.